Welcome to the Hardwood Hustle powered by PGC Basketball. We believe in the value of a coach. We're here to educate, empower, and encourage you to lead like never before. This week, we start a two-part series on the mental side of the game. As coaches, we know how important it is, but we don't always know how to practically develop the much-needed mental skills that will help our players reach their potential. In this episode, TJ and Sam focus on approach and confidence. Let's get started. Welcome back to the Hardwood Hustle. Sam, I'm excited about today's topic because I really think that it is a differentiator. I really think it does make a big impact on your team and even results for your team, also your players moving forward. But I don't think coaches spend enough time on this. And I know I've said it before, but you can ask people, hey, what part of the game is mental? And they'll say, oh, 80%, 70%, 50% of the game is mental. But we just don't spend a lot of time on the mental aspect of the game. And, you know, I don't know the reason for it. My assumption is, is because we got to get in the gym and there's never enough time and we got to get the work done. But if you've coached long enough, you've experienced a confident, connected team, one that believes in each other. You've also experienced players that believe in themselves and they go to a different level. And you've also experienced players that didn't believe in themselves, that underachieved. Um, maybe a lot of disappointment in that season or in their individual career. But what if you had a team full of confident, composed, mentally tough, great approach, competitive greatness? Like, what if you had that with your team? Would things look different? And I think we would all say yes, that it would look different, but we really won't spend a lot of time on that. And so, you know, at PGC Coaching, we have, you know, our, our, flagship, which is our blueprint. And in there, we talk about player development. And most people think about the skills and, you know, shooting, passing, ball control. And it's part of it. It's part of the player development. And it's an important part. But one of the components that we have in our coaching blueprint is the mental part of player development. We have five different things there. You know, developing the right approach, developing their confidence, their composure, their toughness, and their competitive greatness. So today, we're going to dive into that a little bit and, and talk to you coaches about how can you actually make this happen? How can you foster some of these things? Now, we could do an hour plus episode on each one of those five, you know, competitive greatness alone. We could do, you know, an hour in confidence. We could probably do five hours on that. But let's just go high level here and talk to coaches, one, about why it's important. And two, what are some things that you can actually do? Because a lot of times coaches feel helpless here, like, well, I, they just need them to be more confident. But you can help foster that stuff. So, Sam, what are your opening thoughts on this, on the, on the mental approach and developing this in our player development? Yeah, TJ, I think it's everything. I mean, a, a mental – let's start with the, the first com, uh, topic of that mental component, which is approach. And I think it is something you have to coach every day, um, all practice, pre-practice, post-practice, off-season, in-season. It's – you know, not just players, but coaches need it. And, and it starts with the right approach. I think it's as much or more important than what offense, let me back up. It's more important than what offense or defense uh, you run because you got to have the right approach to how you're going to play defense, how you're going to play offense, how you're going to connect in the locker room, how you're going to treat each other. Um, that's, that's everything. And if you don't, if you don't have the right approach, you just won't go as far and as fast as you can go as a player, a team. And yeah, like you said, I think, you know, coaches, last point I'll make on it is I've asked this question a lot in front of groups of players and coaches for the last 10 years is how much of the game is mental? And TJ, I, every one of them says it's over 50. A lot of times they say over 90%. My follow-up question is how much time do you spend coaching the mental and then it's usually on the other side of 10 percent so they don't match up we say it matters a lot but then we don't actually coach it and I spent 15 minutes this morning on, on court with a group of high school players where after our initial warm-up we spent 15 minutes talking about mental approach and because I think it's so important so I'll stop there but that I'm I'm a big proponent that it's, that it's very very important yeah, you know, here's my theory, um, and and I understand this as a, as a coach. I I think a lot of people don't spend time on this as coaches, not because they don't think it's important, because they just don't know what to do here. And man, I, I, this is probably the biggest growth in my coaching journey is understanding 
how to help teach these things. And it's related to culture. It's related to leadership. But really coaching the mental side of the game is something I had to grow. Because originally when you get into coaching, you know, what you know is how to teach shooting, how to teach passing, how to teach the offense that you want to run. Like that's what you know. And so coaches, in my opinion, gravitate towards what they know. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you become with it and the less comfortable you become with the stuff that you don't know as well. Would you agree? You think that's why a lot of coaches maybe shy away from this part of it? Yeah, yes, I think so. I think also I'm not sure how much they really value it. I mean, they say it, but I don't I still think they they fall back to it's it's X's and O's thing and it's the drills and it's it's that sort of thing. So I think it's yes and maybe don't really, really value. But you may you may be right that it, it's that it's really under that well, you, first umbrella. You, you're, you're right. It's probably both. I mean, it's probably that we give it a little bit of lip service, like we don't really think it matters that much. But I, I do think that coaches that have coached long enough recognize that it does matter, you know. And I think there's a lot of times in your early career where you may not know it as much that it matters. Uh, but it's probably both of those things. And those are probably the two main contributing factors as to why it doesn't happen quite as, as much. But I think about a team full of players that have the right approach to the game, the right approach to team. And they're really fun to coach and they achieve a lot. You know, I, I'm constantly talking to our players about this. It, it, we, I'll give you an example. Just yesterday that happened with us, you know, at our school, we have chapel every Tuesday. And look, I'm realistic. Every Every Tuesday, 18 to 22 year olds got to go to this chapel. That may not be something they're super excited about at this point in their life. You know, there's a, you know, 40, 50, 60 year old person talking to them about really big things. And, you know, when I was 18 years old, I was thinking smaller things and I wasn't necessarily thinking about big picture things. And so they're not always fully engaged, whether it's being on their phone or whether it's being on, um, you know, laying back in their seat or putting their head down or whatever it might be. And this is all students, not just basketball players, but all students. And when I see them doing this, I don't think they're aware of what a good approach looks like in that setting. But it's no different than basketball. And I teach a lot of life lessons that help translate to basketball and basketball lessons to life. And you know, I think those two things intertwine. And, you know, my lesson to them yesterday was the multiplier effect, which you and I have used a lot of times where it's like, hey, listen, if 15 players on your team all give back of the hand high fives and everybody slumps their shoulders and whatever, the body language of your team is going to suck. But if everybody gives a high five above the shoulder and they give them a lot and people keep their heads up and they say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, or they nod or they do whatever, like the, the body language is really good. And so a lot of times a player can think, and this happened yesterday in chapel, there was a lot of side conversations going on, right? There's two people talking when the person is singing or preaching or whatever it might be. And yeah, it's just two people talking, but then two other people are talking, two other people are talking. If you multiplied your action, whether it's your body language or talking during chapel or whatever it might be, or sleeping or being on your phone, what if the speaker's up there and all 700 students are on their phone? It looks horrible. It looks like nobody cares. It looks like you're... Now, and But one individual player can think to themselves, well, I'm just checking my text. I'm just using my phone a little bit. Same thing in the huddle. You know, nobody gives high fives. So, you know, well, one player didn't give a high five. Well, it's just one player. But multiply that out. And is your action a good one for the team? And I think that's the same thing as we look at that in life. And I think that mental approach, that approach to how you go about practice, the approach to how you go about work, the approach to how you go about class, like all of those things, we all know. We've all coached special players that showed up in a special way. We know their approach was different and likely their output for the team was different, whether that was in a leadership role or an actual on the court role. But our approach matters in everything that we do. Yeah. And, and it matters in a team setting. You know, if you're if you're a single guy or girl that's 20, 30, 40, 50 years old and you live by yourself and you and you got a job that you don't really have to be on a team with and you just punch in and punch out or whatever it is, you know, sure. That's, that's, it's on you. No big deal. You know, you're a golfer, you know, you know, then you're just affecting you. Um, now it still matters to your own individual success, but yeah, in a team setting, TJ, it's everything. 
you know, you, you've heard this analogy, but we teach it at PGC, which is the lion and the sparrow. And it's everything. What's a lion do when they when they want to sit down and eat? They just sit down and eat. They don't they don't have worried about the you know, the hyenas over there, or the vultures over there or whether it's raining or it's hot. They just focused on eating. And what's a sparrow? A sparrow is, you know, very skittish and worried about everything. And what's that mean in basketball terms? Well, the right a player with a lion approach. They don't they don't worry about what referees they don't worry about a slippery for they don't worry about what type of ball they're playing with are the rims tight is it is it a cold locker room you know is you know is, do I did I wear the wrong pair of socks you know a lion welcomes adversity they welcome oh we got that ref today okay we're ten points behind we got to win anyways oh you know the ball's a little bit slippery okay good I know those sparrows on the other team. They, they'll be worried about that. And so it's everything. It's, it's the difference in champions and, and want to be champions. And it's, you know, the more we can teach our players, those type of things, those just small examples, like, and then giving them the why you gave the players the why a moment ago, like, why does it matter that you sit? Well, you know, I would even take it a step further with your players and you probably did this is like, okay, yes, you're listening to the 55 year old guy, who you don't relate to and you're not even sure about God or Jesus, but you know what, for this next 30 minutes, just, just let's approach it. Like you could learn something. Let's approach it. Like, you know, they're the most important person in the room and who knows you might even learn. So it's like, it's deepening the why behind the what I think and giving real example, like, like going back to if we're teaching coaches how to teach players, it's like, you got to give players specific examples of what a good approach is and what a poor approach is. Yeah, you know, I think about that with fouls in our program, right? I mean, at the very beginning of the year, I tell our players, listen, I myself and all of the assistant coaches here are absolutely horrific, crappy referees. Don't expect any good calls. And throughout the season, we're going to have some bad officials. If we spend even one minute a day focused on whether that call in practice was good or bad. We've diverted our attention from what matters. Can I play through contact? Can I be mentally tough when things don't go my way? Like we can't spend time on that. That's not important. Like no one's ever going to remember that foul call in practice. Like don't put your attention there. The approach of a champion here is that of a lion and the lion's approach and the lion's mentality here is that like, you know what? Hey, I made a good drive. I made a good jump stop. I got fouled. I didn't get the call. Who cares? Sprint back on defense. Like that's what a lion does. And and I think just getting those kind of things out of the way early. And the other thing about this is, do they ever stop? I mean, I feel like I'm teaching approach till the very last day of the season because your approach can never be good enough. You know, I, I love the quote, somebody somewhere with way worse circumstances is doing more with their situation than you are. And that's so true. You know what I mean? Like, think about that. And you've heard this before, but, you know, most of us in America are the top 1% in income in the world. But most of the time, it's not enough. You know, we, we, and it's, we always look at the other side of it. But somebody with a different approach says, I've got more than enough. You know, and, and I think that that applies to us, not only on the court, it applies to us off the court, it applies in everything that we do in life. And you know, when your approach is right, everything else falls in line. And I, it's really critical to really develop the, the approach of a player. If you have lion mentality players with great approaches, you got a shot. Yeah, and I think, I think it again, back to what I think I said earlier, it's a daily conversation. Like we talk about shot selection, you know, being a daily conversation, a weekly conversation. I think approaches to what what do you value the most and i think if if mentality is what you value then then you got to have it every day i i like what you introduced at the beginning tj which is these um off our blueprint that we use pgc coaching so like the next one is confidence and this is a big one i'd love to i'd love to unpack this a little bit so how do you talk to about confidence to your players yeah. You know, I think this is, is good uh, that we're going to talk about these and we'll hit two or three of them in this episode and we'll hit the other ones in another episode because this is just kind of a lot to go into. But, you know, confidence is, uh, man, as coaches, we have the opportunity to give 
and instill confidence, we also have the opportunity to take away confidence. And if I'm just being really transparent, there's a lot of times I've hurt players' confidence over the course of my career. And I regret that. And I really, I really disappointed that I did that. I didn't know any better. I think I just was being a coachy coach and just thought I was challenging them, but I actually took a piece out of their confidence. And I don't think as coaches, we ever want to do that. Like, I don't, I, I don't think we want to build false confidence. Like I'm not a big believer and I guess it's an individual thought, but I'm not a big believer in attaching confidence to things that aren't real. Like, Oh, you're a great shooter. No, you're not. You're not a great shooter. You're not in the gym. You're not working on you. So what do you do with a player like that? Hey, you know, I think that you could be a good shooter and I think your confidence would grow if you would put in the work, right? And then there's a person that does put in the work and then I'm trying to build their confidence. You are a great shooter, you know, but I'm not going to tell the player that doesn't want to be, that doesn't work on it. Oh, you're a great shooter. So I don't think you can attach things to things that aren't real, but I do think you can boost things that are real. You know, like when, when, you know, a player's in a slump, but they're putting in the work. Hey, listen, You've paid the price. The shots will fall. You are a great shooter. You're the guy. You're the gal that we want the ball in your hands. When you're open, we're 100% confident in you. Like those types of comments build confidence in a player where, you know, the other one is like, hey, you know, when you shoot that, like, hey, you just missed two. Why did you shoot that one? Like that can start taking away from the confidence of a player. But I also don't think that you should say, you know, a player misses two. And, you know, they haven't put in the work and be like, oh, yeah, the third one's going to fall, you know, because the odds are in your favor, you know, like I'm not attaching that to something that's not real. So there is an element of confidence that goes with work. You know, I think when, when you've put in the work, you've earned the right to be confident. And I think as coaches, we should boost that. Now, somebody that hasn't put in the work, I'm not trying to tear them down, but I also am not going to attach something that's not real to them. So let's go back a second to what you said, because I think this is an important one to, to unpack is you said this player on your team, um, just every, every coach has this. They have a player who thinks they're better shooter than they are. And the numbers don't, don't play that out. And so you've got to pull them back a little bit. And to do that, there's going to be some truth delivered that could quote unquote hurt their confidence. So in a way, sometimes you're going to go backwards with a player uh, before. So in a, so I don't know. Are you taking away that player's? I agree with what you said to be clear, but I I think this is one we need to talk about. So when you do that, you are in some ways taking away a, the confidence, but it's not really a real confidence. So talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. I think framing is important here, right? Like how do, how do you frame and approach each one of these things? So I think the shooter that puts in the work, you're just always in their corner. You know what I mean? Like you're just attaching positive thoughts to them. You're building up their confidence. The flip side of that, like you just asked about is the player that's really not putting in the work, but they're taking a lot of shots or doing a whole bunch of things. I don't think it's healthy to go to that player and be like, look, you're a crappy shooter stop shooting the ball. I, I think that the way you frame that is, hey, listen, I know that you want to shoot the open shot and I want you to shoot the open shot when you've put in the work. Here's what I'd like to do. I'd like for you to get over 60 on the five minute fatigue drill. I'd like you to get 22 on the build drill. I'd like you to get whatever, like I'd like for you to put the work in. If you're willing to put that work in, I'm willing to put the green light behind you. It, like I and so it's not like you're a crappy shooter shop shooting. It's like, hey, let's go to work so that you can be a confident shooter. And and I think that uh, yeah, I mean, as a coach, sometimes we have to be direct in that. I just think that it's better to call them up than to call them out. Like Monty Williams says, is like, how can I call this shooter up to a place of confidence? Well, I can help them to put the work in, and then when that opportunity comes, then we all believe in that shot that they're taking. And so I think framing is everything in that with confidence and and. Uh, all in on a person that puts the work in, um, you know, call up, not out a player that's not putting the work in um, to get them to that place of where they can be confident. Yeah, I think that's key, too. It's it's like, hey, John, man, I love how you have no fear out there. You shoot the ball with extreme confidence. And I want you to keep that mindset. But we need to talk about 
you know, the work you're putting in. I don't, you know, and then you're, you're divilering. So you, you've, you've acknowledged and praised what you like about them. And then you're saying, Hey, we've got to put in more work. Your, your work has to increase. And then with that, I'm going to be more confident in you. You'll be a more confident shooter. You'll be a better shooter. Cause I do think, I often think about Greg Popovich's quote here, you know, I've heard or soundbite, which he says, he's like, I don't, I'm not going to go into my locker room or in a huddle and, and give guys false praise or tell them something is not true. Like, I don't, I'm not here to motivate them. I'm here to deliver the truth. And now he's coaching professionals and, and that's his mind. But I, I do think about that often that sometimes coaches can over praise and players, I think, can sniff it out. And even if they can't sniff it out, you, you can do some damage if you overpraise um, when, when it's not deserved. Yeah, I, no, I agree. I, and I think that's why that uh, being attached to the work because confidence comes through hard work. And, you know, I think that uh, that false confidence and somebody that, and look, we all have a lot of these players that just think that they're better than they are. And um, we want players to believe in themselves we want players to be confident we sometimes just have to attach that to something that's real and they've attached it to something that's not real and I think you're right I think Popovich is right like you, you can't you can't sugarcoat it you can't tell a player there's something they're not because you want them to be that if they're not willing to do the work and so yeah it's a super fine line it's a really really fine line but I also think a lot of coaches go the other direction of you know, players that do put in the work and they're not getting praised. They're not getting confidence attached to their name. They're not. And I think I think it's very easy for coaches to go the other way. I know that for me, it's easy to go the other way because I can be a perfectionist. I can be, you know, wanting everything to be right, everything to be perfect. And even though a player put in a ton of work and they're shooting 38 percent from the three point line, I want them to be shooting 43 percent. And as a, as a coach that's looking for that kind of stuff that can sometimes be negative, about that, you have to be careful because you might take some undue bites out of somebody or or tell them something in the heat of the moment that might hurt their confidence. And so it's self-awareness. We talk about it, self-awareness just being really powerful in a coach. If, if you're aware of your shortcomings, and one of my shortcomings as a coach is that things are never good enough for me, right? It's also one of the things that probably makes me a pretty good coach is that I really think that, you know, we can always do better and I'm always striving for better. But if I'm not being balanced in the approach of building them up and helping build their confidence while also challenging them, then I could also perhaps bring some players confidence down, which would not be a good thing. Yeah. For any coaches, leaders, parents that are listening, highly recommend a book called Mindset by Carol Dweck. I don't know if you've read that, TJ, but it's it's a really good book about growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And then as as a parent or a coach or a leader, your role in that student player's life is really important. How you praise them matters. So for example, if after the game, TJ's got a kid that went 10 for 11 from three and set a school record, and he got in the locker room and, and praised you know, Chris for setting the record and man can't believe you hit 10 threes and just focused on the entire result. And if you do this with young kids and like their grades, so, you know, my son Jackson gets off the bus, the third grader, daddy, daddy, I got a hundred. And if I just praise the result that you can attach the result to that young person's mindset where they, they then think they've got to go achieve that rather than Chris, man, I know you hit 10 threes, but I want you and I want this whole team to know, what what I know, which is I saw you for six months this offseason shoot 500 threes a day. I've seen you get to practice early and do your shooting routine and stay late and make 100 extra threes. And that's why you set the record today. So that's a that's a little small excerpt out of a mindset book, which is praise the the work associated with the result. And I think that's important as a coach. Uh, that that we do that we basically celebrate what we want repeated critique what you want fixed and that that's an important mindset piece in the coach from a coach's perspective yeah because listen even a great shooter is going to shoot 40 percent from the three-point line they're going to miss more than they make 
And so if it's always about the big shot or it's always about the, what you know, like that, that can be detrimental because there's going to be slumps. There's going to be times when they don't shoot it well. There's going to be, there's going to be all of those things. And so they need to be attached to something that's solid. And I think that the work put into building confidence is solid. The work put into getting that hundred is solid. That work being put into making nine or 10 threes is solid. And so I agree with you wholeheartedly attaching yourself to that and then, you know, occasionally, you know, boosting that performance in a way where it's like, you know, hey, yes, that was unbelievable. You made 10 threes, you know, what a shooter you are. You know, that's, man, no one else we'd want pulling the trigger on that thing. That's it. But it's only that because of the work put in. You know, it's only, you're only to that place because of, of, of something tangible that you actually did. And, you know, but I really think that this is important for coaches to think about every player on your team probably has the right to be confident about something. Some players on your team might have the right to be confident about everything, but we've got to help them believe in that. We have to help them because I've also seen really, really good players, Sam, that have put in the work that are really good at what they do lack confidence. You know, I think about it the other day when uh, um, the, the Serena played her last U S open match and the young lady beat her in that match and in the interview they were talking to her and she said, I never thought I could win, you know, and this is a girl that is one of the top players in the world in tennis that even she has doubts and even she thinks that she's not good enough. Right. And so think about us with our players. We have plenty of players that have put in hard work that they still lack the confidence that they can do it. And I think we have to build into them that they can do it. They do have that ability, and I, I think that will lead to them being a better competitor as well. Yeah, and word, words matter. What your what your players like? Pay very close attention to what your players say, because their words reveal what is really in their heart. Because when I say things, I'm just saying things that really are inside my mind already, in my heart. So, you know, another little trick is like I'm not a good shooter. A lot of players, man, I can't shoot. When a player says that, when they're when they're at halftime and they're in the locker room and they're 0 for 6, and we've all been in those locker rooms, TJ, and the player's like, man, I can't hit anything today. Man, I, I don't got it today. You're right. You don't got it because the more you reinforce it by saying it, the more it becomes true. And there's real science and data behind, TJ, what a negative thought does. It's it's four, I've heard it's four to seven more times more powerful than a positive thought, a negative thought. And then when you actually say it out of your mouth, that scientists will say it becomes 10 times more powerful. So what we, we have negative thoughts circulating in our head all, all, at all times, or potentially at all times. But when we actually verbalize it, it has potential to be, become true. The, the most famous of these is um, Bill Buckner that played for the Red Sox. I don't know if you've seen this. But he, he has the ground ball go between his, his legs, game six against the um, New York Mets. The Mets go on and win the, uh, I guess, 86 World Series. And the curse of the Bambino supposedly continues on because Bill Buckner, I mean, the guy received death threats. He was an all-star gold glove first baseman. What a lot of people know that story, TJ. You can go on YouTube and do and type in Bill Buckner World Series interview. And 11 days, I believe, before that happened, Bill Buckner got interviewed. I don't know. Have you heard this interview before? Okay. He gets interviewed by a local TV station. It's really grainy 1986 video. And unprompted, the interviewer did not ask him this. Bill Buckner says, you know, my greatest, you know, dream come true would be to win the World Series. He said a nightmare would be to let, let a ground ball go through my legs and we lose the game. He says that on an interview 10 days before it happens. It became true. Now, I'm not saying everything we say will become true, but it, what we say does matter, the power of words. And so back to your point, which is a lot of players do have confidence crisis and great players. LeBron James is very well documented, 2011 against the uh, San Antonio Spurs. The Spurs played eight feet off of them. They dared him to shoot. Do that to a player. That messes with your mind. He was struggling, and he had to shut out noise and social media, and then he he asked the Miami Heat um, video coordinator to cut up all this tape and say, 
hey, put together in some of my best shooting performances. He had to rewatch it, retrain his mind. He went out and kind of had an effort attitude. I think he hit six threes the next game in game six. That's LeBron James. He was the best player in the world. So you better believe that high school kid, that college kid, that middle school kid that you're coaching, your best player, they're they're at times struggling with confidence. Yeah. And, you know, you know, a couple final thoughts here is as we wrap up on approach and confidence and in another episode, we'll hit the other three. But speaking it into existence is a big thing, you know, whether it's a negative speaking into existence or a positive speaking into existence, I think is a really powerful thing. And, and, and the other the one that you hit on, too, was just self-talk and being able to talk to yourself in a positive way. And we teach that at PGC all the time. Like, it's okay to be your biggest critic, but only if you're your biggest fan. And I think a lot of players that struggle with confidence are their biggest critic, but they're not their biggest fan. And I think this happens, you know, as we're watching kids grow up and 12, 14, 15 years old and young ladies, young men, like, I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not whatever smart enough. I'm not whatever these things are. And they begin talking to themselves like that. And it becomes a major problem. And they, a gift that we can give them is help them to speak these things into existence, help them to believe in them, help them, help them to have self talk that is really positive because negative self talk can be one thing that just slowly chips away at you. And so I think as coaches pay attention to your players self talk and a step beyond that is teach them how to have positive self talk. I know Sam, when I was coaching Bella's team on your BCB program, one of the things that we had after every practice, I had them go right to their notebooks and write down five things they did really well today. And why to do that? Well, these are, you know, 12 to 17 year old girls and beyond basketball. I just want them to be confident in themselves. I want them to be, you know, assured young ladies that they believe in themselves. And so what was I doing with that? I was just trying to get them to help their self talk, get used to praising themselves, get used to recognizing that they did good things. Sure. They, they made a lot of mistakes and sure they did bad things, but most, a lot of, not most, but maybe most young people remember the things they didn't do well. And I think that's not an age thing. I think there's a lot of people, you know, my age, your age, that same thing. You might have done five great things that day, but you remember the one thing you didn't do well, right? You remember the one thing that didn't go so good. And, and that can be really negative self-talk. And I, I think coaches may struggle with this as themselves as well. And sometimes it may manifest itself in a negative way outward to other people and to players because their self-talk is no good. But it's really important, you know, that, to help you. And that's, that's a tool that you can actually use. Like you can help your players have better self-talk by writing down the things they did. At the end of practice, we do celebrations where players celebrate other players. Some days we have players go around and celebrate themselves. Share something you did really well with the team today. Get used to praising yourself and having great self-talk and having the confidence to be able to do that. But I think it's a powerful gift to be able to give players. Yeah, I, to, to put a bow on what you just said, too, I would just say norm, normalize self-talk. Normalize celebrations in your culture. and normalize the ability to critique yourself. I think sometimes, CJ, we go to one extreme, like make it normal for a player to hear a coach be critical and just receive it for what it is. Two things can be true. Like Bella could have in, in a 30-second drill done something really, really well. In that same 30-second drill, she could have done something very poorly. Those two things can exist, but we got to normalize a little bit of like being able to look at objectively what happened and like facts over feelings. Sometimes we let the feelings become more true than the facts. Okay. The, the, it like I went three for 11 from three. Okay. I went three for 11. That's the facts of it. Uh, had I made one, made one more, I would have been, you know, it would have been a great night. But I, I started out three for three, and then I missed eight in a row. And actually, three of the ones that I missed rimmed in and out. But we it feels worse than it is. So, you anyway, know, I'm going longer than I thought. <laughs> but facts over feelings, normalize self-talk, normalize self-critique, and create that culture. You know, a coach is so important in creating a culture where that can take place. So this is a bit this is an important one, TJ. Glad we got to talk about it. Yeah. You know, coaches, last thing I would say is this, like, 
What if you had a really good ball handler? That would be great for your team. But equally as important, what if you had a really confident player? Right? Like, I think there's a lot of power in that. So when we think about player development, let's just get outside the box and think that there is more to player development than just getting the skills right. The mental aspects matter. And we were able to hit on two of them today, approach and confidence. And we'll hit on the other three uh, in in another episode coming up here. But really appreciate you listening, coaches. Hit us up at hardwood underscore hustle. Let us know your thoughts. Hey, he is Sam Allen. I am TJ Rosine. We are the Hardwood Hustle. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Hardwood Hustle, where we believe in the value of a coach. We want to bring you quality content and journey with you. Stay connected with us on Twitter and Instagram. You can find us at Harwood underscore hustle. From the Harwood Hustle team, thanks again. We can't wait to be with you again next week.